From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 211, recorded on November 23rd, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me tonight from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, everybody. Um, it's dark out. <laughs> that's as that's as good as I can say what the weather is like. It's dark that's out. That's right. 5 p.m. here, it's dark. You're right. That's right. It's dark. Also joining us from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. I, I was thinking you said tonight because it's dark and it just sends that message that it's not, it's not today. It's tonight. <laughs> that's right. Well, we usually record at night, but, you know, we in do. the... Spring well, you do. and summer, it's it's lighter. Now we're in the, the winter, so exactly. that's the way it goes. Exactly. Also joining us from Glasgow, Christina Naula. Hello, everybody. And here it's dark too. And I can hear the rain lashing down onto my the roof rain. window. Oh, no. So it must be wet as well. Christina, I've been meaning to ask you, have you ever seen the northern lights from where you are? I have not, but I am so desperate to see them. But I think I need to go out to the countryside. It's just too much light pollution in the city. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So Dixon, we have to go to Aberdeen to see them. Dixon, uh, it's unfortunate that you missed our twip in Seattle. We had a good time. Yeah, I'm very sorry that I did. Um, oh, don't be sorry. It wasn't your fault. No. It was not my but, but it was. He was breathing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can blame it on Twiv. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But here we are back in studios. So uh, what we do here is a, a, another case. And Daniel, what do we have from last time? Sure. So for those of you uh, tuning in for the first time, those of you tuning back in, um, this was a case uh, where we were consulted about a rash. So a male in his mid-60s, originally from Hong Kong, with a past medical history of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, um, benign prostatic hypertrophy, hepatitis B, uh, chronic obstructive <clears throat> pulmonary disease, so COPD, not on home oxygen, a current smoker, that's not good for you, end-stage renal disease with a right chest uh, catheter on dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and he had presented to the emergency department with progressive shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion for about a week. Um, we do hear that two weeks prior, the patient had missed one session of hemodialysis. Um, this progressive worsening of respiratory status and orthopnea. So that's trouble breathing when he lays down, um, began to develop about a week prior. There was an associated productive cough with white sputum. Um, his last dialysis session was three days prior to admission. Uh, the patient had begun to develop nausea, vomiting um, for about three days and uh, uh, 12, 12 times the last week. He also started to develop some loose stool, so diarrhea. Um, he reports that he was seen by a dermatologist uh, for this uh, itchy rash for three months and told that the rash was due to certain allergies from food. Um, he's been using an unknown cream for about a month, uh, which was not relieving his symptoms. Um, he was recently admitted for management of bleeding from that permanent catheter that I described. Um, and at that point, quite, quite ill, requiring intubation, uh, ventilatory support. Um, ask a little bit, get some background, no recent travel, no recent antibiotic use, no sick contacts. Um, but I do have a bit of a discussion with his nephrologist who reaches out and is concerned about a certain diagnosis. As he says, three other patients that come from uh, dialysis um, go to the same sessions of him have been recently diagnosed with a certain diagnosis. Uh, we take a look at the man. I actually went back to re-examine a little bit more closely. Initially, I was sort of like, here's this really sick guy with pulmonary issues, and you're calling me about a rash. Um, but now I'm focused on the rash. And when I look really closely, I see that there are small, linear, scabbed areas between his fingers. <laughs> um, he has a normal white blood cell count, but his absolute eosinophil count is greater than 1,000. Wow. Um, I think this is also important, his... Um, 
basic metabolic panel. His blood urea nitrogen is 51. His creatinine is 5.1 glucose. 5.1. That's very high. Okay. That's very <laughs> high. All right. We had a small number of guesses this time, folks. You can see why. <laughs> this is complicated. Well, it's complicated. And uh, I also think we're near the holidays, so people are chilling. Yeah, you may be right. A right. lot of our usual participants have not participated so uh, huh. well, well we go with what we have so this is uh, true this is true dixon can you uh sure take that first one <clears throat> sure chris writes i am enjoying these increasingly challenging cases with either a lot of noise or essential data points as a famous infectious uh, physician often <laughs> repeats that's what it says <laughs> a famous infectious disease physician often repeats on an entertainment podcast edutainment Edu I'm sorry, edutainment you're <laughs> absolutely right Occam <clears throat> was not a physician this patient had many things going on and the symptoms he experienced could be attributed to different processes a COPD exacerbation could explain the acute respiratory and hemodynamic symptoms, including shortness of breath, dyspnea or exertion, orthopnea, and white sputum. This respiratory episode and or associated treatment could have exacerbated his renal condition. Nausea, vomiting, anemia, elevated BUN, and creatinine are consistent with progressive renal failure, especially with missing a dialysis appointment. The eosinophilia could be due to COPD. The generalized rash and puritis seems to be transmissible within the dialysis clinic, so argues against a process secondary to renal failure. My guess would be scabies, another potential and likely reason for the eosinophilia. My gut tells me I'm overlooking something, but I cannot put a finger on it. And if you did, you probably caught what this guy had. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to hearing the way Dr. Griffin approaches this case. <laughs> Cheers. Please pick my name, it says. We, well, we did, we did, we did. <laughs> he wants a book, I believe. Hey, <laughs> what's a book? Hey, what's a book? Oh, well, you know, it'll cost you. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Daniel, can you take the next one? All right. Joshua writes, Dear Doctors Depommier, Griffin, Naula, and Rack and Yellow, congratulations on your wonderful and engaging science communication work. Some months ago, thanks to a mention of TWIV on my then favorite podcast, this <laughs> podcast will kill you, EPWKY, <laughs> I discovered first TWIV and then TWIP and then rapidly became all engrossing, though I trust they have proven um, symbiotic rather than viral and parasitic. <laughs> Since this happy accident, I have abandoned most of the other podcasts I had been following, except for TPWKY, as I have been listening to many back episodes of first TWIV and then more recently of TWIP, though I still have hundreds to go. It is currently 18C at the end of a sunny day, which reached a high of 24C. I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit. In my home city in northern Tasmania, as wow. we enter into late spring, the school year has almost ended, and the year 11 and 12 students are about to sit their final exams. I have been a high school teacher for over a decade, but the pandemic and my consequent burgeoning interest in public health is making me consider a possible career change. Tasmania has been largely spared the worst of the pandemic. Our state border was closed in mid-March 2020 for the first time since 1919, at the same time as the national border was also closed. And we only fully reopened to the mainland of Australia in mid-December 2021. As vaccination rates were very high by then, despite a deluge of cases since, less than 200 deaths out of a population of half a million have been recorded. I remain profoundly grateful to all the virologists and other scientists who developed the COVID-19 vaccines, particularly the Pfizer and Moderna, which I have received. I've had my fourth dose, and so far as I'm aware, I still haven't had the Rona, as we Aussies call it. <laughs> the Rona. The Love terrible it. and needlessly high death toll in the U.S. is a tragedy. I, I do agree. hope that Dr. Pommier has made a full recovery by the time this email reaches you. He has. All right. 
But on to the case, which seems to be suffering from two parasitic maladies. In addition to his chronic health problems, it was immediately obvious once track marks between fingers were mentioned that the itchy rash suffered by the unfortunate victim was scabies, which he has endured for three months. Why did the dermatologist not recognize this instead of blaming it on a food allergy? I well remember my horror when a flatmate many years ago revealed he had that infestation. Thankfully, I avoided catching it, but my flesh still creeps at the thought. <laughs> the other dialysis patients mentioned must also have contracted this pruritic pest from exposure at the treatment center. My sister, who is a nurse and with whom I just discussed this case, opined that the dialysis ward should have been cleaned more thoroughly. As to the acute condition that has developed over the week prior to seeking treatment, having downloaded and consulted a certain free PDF well known to y'all, I initially thought that the gentleman, being originally from Hong Kong, might have enjoyed tasty but undercooked crab, crayfish, and crustacea, which are dangerous delicacies enjoyed in some Asian cuisines, resulting in an infection with lung flukes such as Paragonimus, Paragonimus westermani or P. calicati, the later being endemic to the USA. However, paragonomyosis, while characterized by shortness of breath, a cough, diarrhea, and eosinophilia, is not characterized by nausea and vomiting. Moreover, this disease would result in bloody sputum, not white sputum. Therefore, I changed my di diagnosis to Wakana, or green <laughs> vegetable disease, reported from Japan as occurring between the end of August and the middle of October, which is a form of hookworm infection contracted by accidental ingestion of the parasite and cyclostoma duodenale, and is described as resulting in nausea, vomiting, coughing, difficulty breathing, and eosinophilia. This diagnosis better suits the case described rather than lung fluke infection. To treat the scabies, lindane or permethrin cream could be applied or ivermectin used if any is still available. Supplies <laughs> have been misused by the misguided. But I leave it to Dr. Griffin to carefully select which treatment is safest for this patient who has multiple chronic conditions. To treat the hookworm, either albendazole or mubendazole could be used as the doctor will decide Thank you again for all that you do and for your kindness, patience, and unfailing good humor. Yours sincerely, Joshua. Christina, can you take the next one, please? Um, yes, I just need to find it. Sorry, um, because I'm on a different computer. Right, Fiona writes, Hello, Twiplets. I am Fiona from the currently not so sunny but still beautiful seaside town of Oban in Scotland. I'm a clinical fellow work working with Public Health Scotland and also studying for a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene with the University of Glasgow, which is how I was introduced to this wonderful show by our tutor, Christina Naula. I feel a bit of pressure to get this right, knowing she's... The one of the hosts of this show and my classmates may also be listening in, but I am inspired to give it a go and develop my learning and confidence. I believe this gentleman has been infected with strongyloides stercoralis, which has resulted in disseminated strongyloidiasis. His significant medical history, including being immune compromised, puts him at high risk of severe infection. His respiratory, GI and dermatological findings are also suggestive of this, although diagnosis can be difficult. The larvae may be seen may be seen with stool microscopy, but multiple samples may be required. It is likely the other three patients mentioned have also contracted this infection. Ivermectin is a drug of choice, although immunocompromised patients can apparently be refractory to treatment and multiple courses may be required. It is also worth noting that ivermectin dose should perhaps be considered with caution in this patient due to possible liver impairment secondary to his chronic HPV infection, although LFT is not shown, as it is heavily metabolized in the liver. However, this shouldn't prevent him from receiving the drug. I hope I did my Glasgow Tropical Med Diploma team proud and I did receive the pri and if I did receive the prize I would donate it to my local hospital library as they lack any parasitic or tropical medicine books. But we do get exposed to travels from all over the world and think your book would be an invaluable resource for other clinicians and med students. 
Thanks for all your hard work, banter and entertainment, especially when I have to make the long commute to Glasgow from Oban, a six-hour round trip, for work every couple of weeks. I've learned a lot, not just about parasitism, but other interesting facts, including fishing. Warm regards, Fiona. P.S. I hope Dixon is feeling better. <laughs> I have to say that they make a wonderful single malt in Oban. I was Dixon. just going to add that also. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. It's very good. Yeah, oh, I've actually. Sure. So, uh, do you remember Hamish Young Dixon? Who could forget? That's where he was from, Oban. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. Wow. I hope he's still with us. He is. He is. Yes. Cool. I right. haven't been in Oban for a while, but I hope to. I mean, it's a beautiful little town. So, yeah. Yeah. Is it on the water or not? It is, yeah. It is on the, and it's kind of opposite the small island called Carrera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it's not far from Mull, so you would take the, Mary, the ferry to go to Mull, which is one of the Hebridean islands. So it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Nice. All right, our next one's from Jason. Greetings, TWIP hosts. It's a cool seven degrees C in Seattle, Washington. The tide is high and the Puget Sound is choppy as I write this. As to the parasitic diagnosis of the man from Hong Kong with multiple comorbidities, this patient appears to be suffering from a case of Strongyloides stercoralis hyperinfection. This patient was probably infected with Strongyloides nematode many years ago while residing in rural Hong Kong. The helminth is normally acquired via the transcutaneous route after which immunocompetent patients may enter a chronic infection state. During chronic strongyloidiasis, patients typically exhibit nonspecific symptomology such as intermittent diarrhea and constipation. It's during this time that the spread of the disease is normally held in check by the host's immune system. Our patient likely received steroid therapy for a recent episode of acute hypoxic respiratory failure secondary to COPD, at which point chronic strongyloidiasis, no longer held in check by a robust immune system, shifted into a hyperinfective phase in which the L3 larva stage of the parasite auto-infected the patient en masse. The patient now exhibits a constellation of signs of strongyloides hyperinfection, including eosinophilia, a cough, producing white sputum, a diffuse rash, which may be either the result of an immune reaction to migrating worms or secondary bacterial infection, linear scabs between his fingers, larva currens in this case, hmm. diarrhea and shortness of breath. While there are several high-tech methods to diagnose strongyloidiasis, the gold standard diagnostic method remains visualization of larvae either in stool or in the duodenum itself. Effective tests include the Behrman concentration method, Haradi Mori filter paper culture, nutrient agar plate culture, or duodenal biopsy. Once diagnosis is confirmed, treatment with ivermectin should begin promptly. The 2021 Sanford Guide to antimicrobial therapy recommends 200 micrograms per kilo per day by mouth for two days. However, a 2019 paper published by Krilowicki and Nutman in Infectious Disease Clinics of North America suggests that ivermectin therapy may be administered for an even longer duration in severe cases such as in hyperinfection. And the CDC page on strongyloides states that ivermectin in cases of hyperinfection syndrome disseminated strongyloidiasis should be given as follows. 200 micrograms per kilogram per day orally until stool and or sputum exams are negative for two weeks. Warm, warm regards, Jason. <laughs> Holy cow, Jason. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I would say. Oh, we're back to you, Dixon. We are. <clears throat> Mark writes, Hi, Twippers. My guess is that the patient in TWIP 210 has a hookworm infection. That is consistent with the symptoms and signs and their ordering. First, there is a rash and itching as the parasite migrates to the skin, possibly with an allergic reaction causing whole body reaction. Friends, I think that might be consistent with the symmetrical raised rash described. Then there are respiratory symptoms as the parasite enters the lungs. Then there are GI symptoms after the parasite travels up the trachea and is swallowed entering the GI tract. Another possibility would be an infection with Strangulitis stercorellis, which has a similar progression, but the nausea and vomiting seem to be more associated with hookworm. 
presumably from the irritation that hookworms cause as they attach to the intestinal walls. The most likely hookworm species for the U.S. would be Nicator americanus, but remember mm. this guy was from Hong Kong. Uh, <laughs> cheers, Mark. Wow. We're all over the place here. They are. <laughs> Daniel, you're next. All right. Michelle and Alexander from the first Vienna Parasitology Passion Club write, highly regarded sarcop teachers. <laughs> <laughs> we will try to be brief this time. The patient is suffering from a severe infection with the scabies mite Sarcoptes scabii. The clinical signs of itching, erythematous papular eruption, and lesions between the fingers point toward this diagnosis and are very typical. In this case, the patient's immunosuppression predisposes him to a more severe presentation, which includes generalized erythema and blood eosinophilia. This is not uncommon in medical settings like dialysis units or care homes, and these infections, like in this case, often present with, within the context of an outbreak. Also, the fact that our patient obviously seems to have a parasite disease which can be transmitted from patient to patient significantly reduces the list of possible differentials. We could not think of anything besides scabies, which fits the mentioned symptoms very well. Most other symptoms of the patient may be due to his extensive past medical history, COPD exacerbation, community-acquired pneumonia, etc. It's easy to think that dialysis can replace kidney function, but patients with end-stage renal disease commonly have several comorbidities, and without transplant, their prognosis is not great. This patient has a life expectancy of 4.8 to 5.7 years as compared to the 16.3 to 19.9 for his peers, U.S. renal data system. Treatment with permethrin cream or oral ivermectin. Additionally, a hygiene plan should be implemented, which could be difficult considering the functional status of the patient and the lack of social support. Furthermore, some form of outbreak management at the dialysis unit is probably in order. We are very happy to hear in your other podcast, that Professor De Pommier is doing well. Thank you for this great case. All the best, Michelle and Alexander from the First Vienna Parasitology Passion Club. All right, that does it. Not a lot. Six guesses. Not a lot, folks. Okay. I suppose we're recording quite soon after the last recording. It's too, indeed, it's indeed. Yeah. It's just yeah. a, a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. And it's a difficult case. Well, well, that's Indeed. that's a good one. So let's. Um, I think we've got three other people to mm. to throw their hats in the ring, so to speak. And we do. And, and maybe we could even, as as the hats are thrown, uh, maybe a discussion of of what we think about the the guesses so far. So mm. who who wants to go first? Yeah. Well, um, I guess I should be the one. Um, <clears throat> I got you by age, if, if nothing else. Um, <laughs> Age before beauty. I mean, Age this, before uh, I beauty, that's right. Just because I'm older doesn't mean I know more. <laughs> I, you know, I was leaning in the direction of scabies, obviously, because of the between the fingers rash. It's typical. But in order to catch rabies, uh, scabies, not rabies, uh, you actually have to come in contact with the individual. You have to shake their hand or you have to grab them or something else. Um the the option for stridulites is there's a fecal contamination of the local environment, and then the next patient that comes in sits down and catches the infection that way. But that's actually not probably what was going on. Um, it's kind of difficult. I need some more diagnostic tests here before I can render a, a definitive diagnosis. But I I think he at least has scabies, but I'm not sure about anything else. That's yeah, so you're going with scabies, and I, I like the comments about transmission. Um, okay, who's next? Um, um, yeah, I'm a bit worried about getting it wrong. <laughs> 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 Since I now know that our students are listening, um, I, I, I thought there is definitely a touch of scabies, um, but I don't know. I'm not sure. There may be something else. At, I don't really know enough about COPD and renal failure to, to put it all together into a single puzzle, jigsaw fitting together nicely. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll maybe go with a, a touch of scabies and maybe something else, but I'm not sure. I'm just going to admit to that. 
Okay, Vincent. <laughs> so I, I think given the description of the rash, right, between the fingers, yeah. it seems likely that we have scabies at least here, right? Um, is, but I agree with Dixon. It's not clear mm. how he could have acquired it. But or the, also the three other patients, actually. Yeah, exactly. That the, the, the mm. um, <clears throat> Someone right. is concerned that there's been several other patients in this dialysis unit. I mean, could it have? Could it transmit from the from the arms of the chairs where you sit in? You know, they're gripping the the arms. No, and no the, these I are. I think it's skin to skin contact. Isn't it is. It, is. Yeah. it has to be because the the mm. the mites are found under the skin, not on top of the skin. So you'd have mm. to have really intimate contact for this to work. But but this could be a severely immune compromised yes. person, mm -hmm. and scabies is just one of the things that he would acquire. But those other two guesses, I think hookworm is a little bit far out because it has to undergo development mm. in the soil first or in the, uh, f the fecal deposit. Strongyloides can come out infectious. So mm. strongyloides would be a better guess for the second mm. infection. And I think I would, I, I would say that it's a real possibility. Yeah, so I have yeah, to admit that I was... Yeah, I was thinking was... about that too. Sorry, Vincent. It's okay. Go ahead, Christina. No, I, I was thinking strongyloides doesn't really sound that unreasonable either. I mean... No. I don't know. It, if I had to bet my life on it, I think I would just withdraw from the bet. <laughs> <laughs> there is one caveat here with regards to strongyloides, and that was with an eosinophilia of over a thousand. Mm. Strongyloides also induces a bacteremia and a septicemia, which usually ends up killing the patient, not the worm, but the bacteria that they come in with. Mm. With that many... Um, with that much bacterial overload, the eosinophilia in the body is um, eliminated. The, the, the eosinophilia count goes to zero, but the neutrophil count goes way up. And usually it's a shift to the left, and it's as a result of being exposed to those bacteria, not the parasite itself, not the worm. So you've still got a huge count of eosinophils here. And if it's true, it's in the very beginning of this phase of um, bacteremia and septicemia followed by death. And I think that this guy, we need some more tests, Daniel. Give us some more tests. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, so this is good. So this is a great discussion. So, um, yeah, we... Before you move on, we also need more information on the other patients yeah, so that gonna, caught right, it. Exactly so maybe right, you can exactly. throw that in as well. Yeah, no, these right. are, I mean, I think these are excellent, you know, discussion points, excellent emails. And so, um, first to the point that I think Dixon is bringing up with strong alloides is that um, recently on ID Puscast, I don't know if um, y'all are listening to that, but it'll be a plug for that. We discussed um, basically the, the U.S. experience with strong alloides. Like, so how All many right. cases, thousands of cases, you know, and there is, you know, sort of a 10, 15 percent mortality. Um, so yes. people with strong alloides yes. actually, they die and they die of that, that bacteremia, that sepsis, because basically these are, these are animals that are coming through, entering our bodies and then defecating, uh, you know, gram negative exactly. laden exactly. feces. Um, and there's also a particular rash. Um, the rash with a disseminated strong alloides, um is usually, um, well, quite often abdominal, right? Yes. When they're disseminated. Um, and you can actually, if you look at the rash on the abdomen, um, we call it running larva, so larva curans, because it'll actually move about a centimeter an hour. So you can actually, if you take photos over time, you can see the larvae running through the skin. Um, so the, the rash here was, was not necessarily characteristic of that. Um, but I did. I have to say we, we considered strong alloides in the diagnosis. So a couple, I'm going to give you a couple little bits more information. Um, so one, I spoke to the, uh, the nephrologist, um, and this gentleman had only missed one dialysis session. So they've been really good about this. Um, the other is the, the other individuals who, who had a similar problem. They actually had confirmed scabies. And I'm going to ah. give you a little bit more information. The other individuals attended the same dialysis sessions with this gentleman. Oh, so right. the, the group of individuals were all sitting right next to each other, you know, with chairs ah, okay. basically abutting one another. So that's sort of a description of the contagion. The other is, is people wear clothes when they go to the dialysis centers, right? So they're sitting in chairs, um, they're wearing clothes, um, right. but, you know, they, they don't have, you know, they don't have long sleeves on, right? The arms are, you know, 
things are rolled up. This gentleman actually has the chest access port, right? Um, yes. So he's you know just sort of describing that. Um, so we sent off some testing, and I'm going to give you a little more information. So the information about the the other folks, his stool, ova, and parasites was negative. His strongyloides serology was negative. Um, he, uh, you know, not walking around barefoot, he's been in this country, though he originally was from, um, from Hong Kong. He hasn't returned for many, many years, which was, he and I had a, a fun chat about, you know, Kowloon and, and the territories and Hong Kong. Um, all right. Does that, does that help anyone with their diagnoses? <laughs> well, it yeah. sort of gives it I away. I think also the rash, actually, Daniel, you, I think you described it as a kind of a symmetrical rash. And is that not something also, you know, that would apply to scabies? Yeah, I mean, that was, I'll say, and this is, I think, interesting because, um, you know, I ended up clinically feeling like this was scabies, clinically confident enough to go ahead with, with treatment. Um, and, you know, there, there is a characteristic when you look at the rash between the fingers, this yeah. sort of small, like basically they're burrows is what you're seeing. Um, and then interesting enough, and this is a problem, uh, this gentleman had gotten biopsies of the erythematous areas, which is really not the thing to do. Because mm -hmm. there's no scabies, there's no mites no. in the rash. No. The rash is actually a response to right. you know, the immune system debt. And so you really got to go where the money is and the money is between the fingers. So once I heard the story, once I heard this guy was really regular with dialysis attendance, I had this nice epidemiology of the other folks with the same scabies confirmation. We're physically at the same session sitting together. Um, that's when I really did the close and you could see what were characteristic um, burrows. So treated this gentleman with ivermectin and the permethrin cream and he... Um, he improved so much happier great. man great great what about his kidney function and stuff like this those are all that's why yeah, he so was he's, there obviously he's chronically on dialysis right so you know what i was looking for was is this a uremic type um rash so the the bun of 51 really this is uh -huh. not uremia um the creatinine of 5.1 you know the dialysis that's going to bounce up and down but you know chronic chronic end-stage renal failure got it got it so so daniel <clears throat> i was very impressed with jason's suggestion and he even said the the rash between the fingers are larva currens yeah so that was interesting and i think that there are so there's there's different there's three different rashes associated with strong -aloidy. so you know people often remember one they get very excited so i'm going to make sure i point out there's three rashes so there's the initial which is the the area of invasion, right? So um, I don't know right. if people remember at one point, um, I had a case that I was consulted on by the, um, the Peace Corps. And it was a, a young man actually sat in, um, in, in poo. And so had the horrible rash where there was invasion. It actually wasn't a, wasn't a human strongyloid. It was a different subspecies. So it was very difficult to treat. Um, so that's the invasion, um, you know, the ground itch rash. Right. Then there can be the larva curans, which I described, where you see these streaks. And actually, if you, you take photos, take a few photos, you'll see that they're moving over time. Um, and then there's also something called a thumb print um, purpurer, a peri-umbilical thumb print purpurer. Yes. And this is where the person is becoming septic. And actually, it looks like thumb prints all over the belly. Um, they tend to um, have thrombocytopenia. They tend to be incredibly ill. Wow. So three three strongyloides rashes, but not not really a scabbed burrowing appearance between the fingers. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. This was a very common infection back in the fifties and sixties, maybe even before that. Also, when um, kidney transplants first came in, uh, they would start by giving you steroids and and an immunosuppressant so that you wouldn't reject the kidney, and without realizing that the patient had strongyloides. They ended up uh, dying from strange ways. So there was a rich l literature on that subject in the 50s and 60s to sort of set the stage for, well, then everybody should be treated for strangulitis first, even if you don't detect it, you're not sure it's not there. Mm. And then it, it raised the question of medical ethics, should you actually be treating someone for something that they don't have? Um, the one that I remember most, though, was from a dermatologist at Columbia who uh, brought me the picture of the abdomen of the patient. And it was a perfect outline for the transverse colon. 
Oh, it wow. was it was absolutely perfect. And then they biopsied the skin and found all the larvae. And unfortunately, the patient went on to die from a overwhelming septicemia. And that that paper was published also. In fact, one of the pictures in our textbook is from that case of this larvae in the skin. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, we, in general, it's now recommended that serology for um, strongyloides be done before yeah. transplant, before significant immunosuppression. Indeed. But the serology test is only 85% sensitive. So yeah, it's sort of exactly. a joke. Like, you do the exactly. serology test, and if it's positive, you obviously treat. And if it's negative, you yeah. obviously treat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no matter which. Well, with ivermectin, you've got a nice drug. Uh, you've got a nice re, re, it, a recourse. It's very, yeah. You do. Um, yeah, we usually just do a two-day, you know. Right. So I think the comment by one of the writers of the letters was very funny, though, if there's any left. If there's any left, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's it all in mar Steal it from your dog. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Steal it from your dog. We have uh, sheep ivermectin here in the house. Okay. <laughs> we, we don't want to know why that's the case, Vincent. No, we're not going there. Well, my, we have foxes in the yard who have mange, scabies, basically. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. And they lose all their fur, and, and, and in the winter they'll die because they're, they're going to freeze, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah, they, yeah. Spend, they spend so much time itching that they don't hunt for food. And my wife ah. was concerned, so she bought, she went to a local place and bought she and then she puts out food for them with ivermectin in it and they've gotten better they've oh, that's interesting. Got, that's interesting. grown their fur back it's very cool oh that's that? fantastic no that really yeah, is lovely. that's great yeah all right it's time to give away a book and i just want to say today i packed up three books because <laughs> i'm a little behind so we're going to go out on friday and i have three people who won books and i don't have your addresses so we have uh -oh. justin who may be the same justin who says warm, warm <laughs> regards, okay? But maybe not. Uh, Justin, Alice, and Owen. Please, I, I don't have any email from you. I might, but I maybe I can't find it. Please just twip at microbe.tv. Send your address so I can get the books to you. Right. All right. And now we have a, a book <clears> to <throat> give away here. So we need a number between one and six. You need a Are drum roll. Ready, <laughs> Dixon? <laughs> Number two. Number two is Joshua. There you go. So let me write winner here because I often forget to do that. Winner. This is good. This is good. This is good. Joshua, who, uh, where is Joshua? From? Tasmania. Is it Tasmania? The first time writing as well. And the convert from this Hobart. podcast will kill you. This is from a city in northern <laughs> Tasmania. I don't know too many cities in northern Tasmania, but I've been to Hobart. So mm -hmm. I presume that Hobart is where he's from. All right, Joshua, twip at microbe.tv. I'll need your address and telephone, and I will ship this out to you uh, sometime next week. All right, what do we have next? Uh, what's hero. next? On the, we have a hero. Dixon, who's we, our hero? Our hero is the gentleman who did not uh, participate in our twip session at the AS Team and H meeting last month. Or earlier this month, I should say. His yeah, name what, is, what happened to Steve? Is he okay? We don't know. He, he, he's uh, in such demand that I presume that he just got out of communication with the normal line of, please tell Steve that he's welcome in our show. Uh, the gentleman's name is uh, Stephen L. Hoffman. I'm reading now from his Wikipedia page. The reason why he has a, P a Wikipedia page is because uh, he has a, um, a rich history of accomplishments, including being the former president of the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Stephen and I go way back as friends. I've known him since he was in college. I've known him since, well, just after that, when he got his first job. Uh, he was teaching at Cornell, and, he, and then he got his MD degree from Cornell. So he stayed there for a while, then went to the um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and got a diploma in tropical medicine. Uh, he then established the Ben Keene Fellowships for... Um, people that were um, financially disadvantaged so they would give them travel grants in order for them to uh, attend the AS H meeting, which he's well known for. But he's, he's mostly known now for his work on malaria. And um, 
he's followed up on the finding that we will discuss in the papers uh, that the sporozoite stage of Plasmodium falciparum contains antigenic epitopes which protect against the infection and um, undefined, uh, that is up until present. And uh, so he's famous for establishing um, a company, Synovia, I believe that's the name of his company. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, where does it say that here? That Come on, you guys know the name of the video. company. Sanofia. Scenaria. Scenaria. I'm sorry, Scenaria. Scenaria. Mm-hmm. Scenaria. They did the, um, I guess you'd call it the sledgehammer killing the fly approach. They irradiated infected mosquitoes and then with human volunteers to dissect out the salivary glands of these infected mosquitoes. Uh, They irradiated the sporozoites and then they injected them, attenuated into um, volunteers and showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that the sporozoite stage of malaria contains protective antigens which results in sterile immunity. And he's still trying to follow up on that by working out a more uh, labor, a less labor intensive way of obtaining the sporozoites. So there's even a robotic program (laughs) for dissecting out the head of female Anopheline mosquitoes. It's Anopheline Stevens eye and the, the, the salivary glands are quite visible if the pull is done correctly. So the head is separated from the thorax, the three salivary glands are exposed, and then the robotic goes in and takes those three salivary glands, which contain a lot of sporozoites, and then on to the next step. That's the hard way around. The easy way around is to find out what the epitope is and then do a molecular vaccine, maybe in this case based on uh, mRNA. Who knows? <clears throat> but Steve has uh, an international reputation. He's been on lots of boards. And uh, I really have a lot of respect for him because he doesn't take no for an answer. He knew that the sporozoite stage was the stage to go after. He thought the best way to prove this in humans is to repeat the experiments that were done in mice. He did it. Everybody accepts it. And in fact, one of the results of one of the papers that we'll discuss today was based on a finding that they got by being exposed to the irradiated uh, mm. sporozoites from uh, Anopheles Stevens and I. So, um, for my money, he's very perseverant, and you would have heard him say this had he been available for the podcast. But I'm sorry that he. Uh, I asked him, and he said yes. But uh, then I, unfortunately, came down with COVID and had to leave the meeting, and uh, couldn't follow up on that. And you left us. I did. And- I had to. I I went into isolation basically. Yeah. I think this is cool that he was. Raised in Belmar, New that's Jersey. That's right. Exactly. That's not far from where you are. That's right. And exactly graduated right. from Asbury Park High School. Look at that. Look Who's at that. from Asbury Park? Does anyone know? I guess the boss. The boss. That's right. I don't know. Do you know him, uh, Daniel? Do you know Steve uh, Bruce Springsteen? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure Nobody. out if you want to know if I'm close friends with the boss or with the boss. <laughs> I just wanted to know if you knew his music. That's why. <laughs> yeah, I'm. A, I'm actually a big, big fan. I was. Uh, I was a big fan of uh, the whole Asbury Park music scene. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Jake yeah, yeah, Giles. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. Right, right. Very cool. I once saw. I went to the convention center where they had a lot of concerts, and I saw a mountain there. Wow. <laughs> I love Mountain. They were great. All right. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. All right. Now, Dixon, we're going to do a paper or two we papers. We're going to so do two papers. Take it away, <laughs> Dixon. Okay. So I, I don't want to be the uh, the point person for this because actually the paper that's that was sent to me, I, I got the wrong paper. So what I got was last year's version <laughs> Daniel, of this year's- Daniel, he's making excuses. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not. It was my fault, of course, because I should have downloaded all the- papers that Daniel sent me because the papers are behind a paywall and I don't have access to that. But what I would like to tell you is how we came to this, the present clinical trial, which is a phase two clinical trial. So phase, before phase one, uh, Stephen Hoffman's company, uh, <laughs> which I'm still blocking on. Um, Sonoria. 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 I'll, I'll get this. Showed 
conclusively that irradiated sporozoites contain the, the epitope that's important, or an epitope that's important. Turns out that the surface is covered with a tetramere of amino acids, and the tetramere of amino acids, while it's antigenic, is not the protection-inducing antigen. The protection-inducing epitope is a peptide. It's still a, it's a, it's four amino acids long, and it connects the tetramere that's repeated to the C-terminal end of that long um, polymeric protein. And so there's a junction, and there are four amino acids which are very important for the epitope. And they discovered this by one of the volunteers for the uh, uh, irradiated sporozoid study. The, the guy was totally immune to, a reinf to an infection, and they isolated some of his B cells and cloned them out and discovered which clone of B cells was producing the antibody, which recognized not the tetramer that everybody else was working on, but this new tetramer, which was the connecting peptide between the, as I just mentioned before, and the C-terminus. So that now becomes the epitope of choice, and the monoclonal antibody that recognizes that has been produced in quantity. Dixon, can I ask you? You may. So before we put it in people, is yes. there something that Yeah, they went to done? mice. They and did it in what mice. What did they do in mice? They did the same experiments that they did in people, <clears throat> except that uh, they used Plasmodium burgii, which is a uh, okay. lookalike for Plasmodium falciparum, and uh, they discovered that the same epitope on the sporozoite of P. burgii is also on the sporozoite of Plasmodium falciparum. So that that was a um, a good match, and then they that gave them hope to go further with this because for years it had languished after they discovered at NYU that irradiated sporozoites induced protection. Uh, they drove themselves crazy trying to find out why this tetramer did not induce protection as well as the entire sporozoid. And it turns out that there's this other epitope that was unrecognized prior to the study in uh, 2021, which this the paper I will hold up to my <laughs> this paper right here, one in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published with a long list of authors, and I, I won't read their names, but uh, they all should be given a lot of credit for this study because what was done was they uh, started with a pool of 118 volunteers. Uh, these were un, um, people who had never experienced malaria before. They whittled it down to to two groups. One group would receive the monoclonal antibody, given in various doses and in various routes, and w the other group would be the uh, placebo that received saline or another monoclonal that had no relevance to malaria. And then they ultimately ended up with nine volunteers that had received the monoclonal that protects, and six volunteers for the placebos. They then exposed both groups to the same number of infected Anopheline, in this case Anopheles Stevens eye, raised in the laboratory, infected uh, via blood uh, that they could, you can grow Plasmodium falciparum in vitro, so you can grow the strain up to large numbers. The uh, membrane through which the mosquito feeds is guaranteed to have um, the gametocytes in there, which are necessary for the transmission of this from human to mosquito. The mosquito cycle was established. The um, mosquitoes were then allowed to take a second blood meal, in this case on a person. They were either immunized or they weren't. And then the excitement. You know, this sounds like a uh, an original experiment by Louis Pasteur when he was doing the rabies uh, vaccination experiments with his sheep. And... Uh, <clears throat> Remember the scene in the movie, at least, when Louis Pasteur comes and he sees all these sheep and they're all dead. And he, he just looks at everybody and, oh, this can't be right. And somebody said, like this, and half of the sheep woke up. <laughs> of course, the other half were dead and the other half were just asleep. So in this case, uh, they looked at days 
I guess, 8 through 24. And that's the, the pre-patent period for malaria is about eight days. So that after eight days, it's now in the blood. And so either you're infected or you're not. And they did a PCR test. Sorry, they didn't look for the parasites. They actually looked for the um, for the DNA. That's too bad because I would have liked to have seen a blood smear or something like this. But nonetheless, what they found was that five out of six of the people that did not receive the uh, monoclonal protection <clears throat> were infected with uh, plefacipiram. And all nine that received this monoclonal antibody were negative out to day 24. <clears throat> Pardon me. And some of them, well, there was one person that didn't even get the challenge infection for three months and then was given the challenge infection because he was sick with some other problem. And then he came back and they said, well, we might as well try the test anyway. And he was not infected. So what they had done with this this monoclonal antibody, they had altered it so that it does not get degraded as fast as normal IgG. Normal IgG has a half-life of about 30 days or something like that. And this antibody molecule was modified so that it resembled fetal IgG. And fetal IgG has two amino acid substitutions. And I'm, um, I read this paper three times yesterday, but I'm still forgetful as to which amino acids were important. But just know that instead of an adult IgG molecule for the FC fragment, there is now a substitution of two amino acids, which makes it more recyclable. And it's Half-life is now out to 60 to 70 days rather than 30 days. And that, that's really why young newborns, or newborns, they're all young, uh, live through a lot of infections because their antibodies can last a little bit longer than most other people's. <clears throat> so that's the monoclonal that we're dealing with. And that was phase one. Phase one must have elicited an enormous um, celebration not only among the the investigators, but also among the people who participated in that study, because as far as I can tell, almost nothing is 100% in nature. And yet, this experiment turned out to show just that. This monoclonal antibody could prevent, it could induce a sterile immunity. Dixon. Yes, Vincent. Why is it... <clears throat> Why is it okay to challenge people with pfalciparum? Because in this case, this is a non-drug resistant strain. Okay. It's a laboratory strain. And the moment you are positive, they give you the drug. And they give you two drugs. They don't just give you one drug. And that they, gets rid of it. It gets fine. rid of it. And, okay. and there's no liver stage that lasts in okay. pfalciparum infection. So all you're doing is treating the blood stages. And, it. It, and, and it's 100% susceptible. So that's why they can do it. All right. Now, on to phase two. Daniel, take it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, so I, I will. So, what really brought this to our attention was a, um, a more recent publication um, Safety and Efficacy of a Monoclonal Antibody Against Malaria in Mali. Not Malawi, but Mali. Right. Can, can I interrupt you just for a moment and say that yeah. in the first paper, in the 2021 paper, they did monitor side effects of the, of the uh, in quotes, unquote, so infusion. We'll just call it an infusion of monoclonal antibody. And some people had a headache. Some people, nobody had a fever. Uh, some people were nauseous. These are typical nonspecific side effects from basically any drug. Uh, there was nothing specific about uh, any person receiving the monoclonal antibody as a, a, a way of intervening in the infection. So now, okay, sorry. No, no, that's good. So it so passed it muster. It passed muster for phase one. Yeah. That's what so I'm in phase one, I think this is important that, you know, Dixon, you alluded to this. You know, phase one, you're talking about nine people, right? right. So, mm -hmm. you know, getting 100% nine people is, you know, are, are you lucky? Um, and so now, now you want to go to a, a phase two trial. And yeah, yeah. here they're going to look at, you know, over 300 individuals. So, um, you know, many, many authors here. This is the Mali Malaria Monoclonal Antibody Trial Team. Um, and so I will, we'll have a link in the show notes so folks can um, actually read through and see just this long list of, uh, of people that participated. Um, but Daniel, so, can I just ask, is that behind a paywall? 
Y- yes. You know, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this one is. Uh, okay. I'm trying to figure out if it was or not. Um, because I know I, I sent these out for all of us to share. Mm. Um, right. So, yeah, that's that's a challenge. Um, you know, you'll still be able to get and see the original article and in the abstract and the authors, but mm-hmm. you may, yeah, there may be paywall with the issues with um, accessing the full. Um, do you want to, I don't know if, uh, do you want to check quickly there, Christina, while we're chatting? I could see if it is. Yes, yeah, I can do that. Because um, mine will, my computer will just sort of let me through. Yeah, mine as well, actually. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, no, it's, it looks uh, like this is behind a paywall. So, yeah, yeah you're just going to yeah. get, yeah, it's okay. unfortunate. It's really, it really is a shame, you know, let me vent for a second about that. Is. That here is research, which is really critical to parts right. of the world. That's right. Where That's resources right. are limited. So, you're going to put up a paywall and not let people access this. So just by the way, um, you know, maybe you journal folks should think about this. Maybe there should be some way of, of creating access. Maybe you get access if you're, you know, trying to get this from outside, you know, a resource rich company country or something. So anyway, let my venting end there. Um, so (laughs) taking this, (laughs) taking this, should have Alan Dove on the show. (laughs) Yeah. Taking this long, um, history of, of understanding the potential of antibodies, understanding potential targets. Now, having in hand this monoclonal antibody, having the phase one, they went ahead to look at an efficacy phase two trial in 330 individuals. Um, You know, is it going to be safe when you get up to this many people? Is it going to be efficacious when you get up to this many people? Um, And what they're going to go and do here is they're going to look at this in in Mali over a six-month malaria season. Um, So they they did uh, a part A where there was... um, There were escalating doses and then a part B where they're actually going to look at at the efficacy. So the primary efficacy endpoint um, is a time-to-event analysis with the first um, P. falciparum infection um, detected on blood smear. Um, And they're going to be doing these um, every two weeks for 24 weeks. Um, And what they do is first they clear everyone. First they treat everyone. Um, to clear possible infection, and then they they go forward. Um, and what do we see? Um, so the the infections were detected in um, 35.5 percent of the folks that got the 10 milligrams, 18.2 percent um, of those who received the 40 milligrams, um, and 78.2 percent in those that received placebo. So what they're going to report is at six months, the efficacy of the 40 milligrams as compared to placebo was 88.2%. Um, the 10 milligrams was was uh, 75%. Um, so I, I made a couple comments and we'll kind of discuss this a bit more. Um, so the participants got a single infusion, um, day zero, and then they were followed at these this various, um, you know, two weeks through 24 weeks. Um, the trial assessments were physical exam and blood collection. Um, but what about symptoms or severity, right? Um, right. And, and that sort of, I thought, was a bit of a um, limitation here. And I understand, but maybe this is something we can get more information about. You know, if you got, let's say, 10 milligrams, we're going to talk a little bit here about cost issues, like is this really viable in a limited resource setting? Um, just the fact that you went ahead and got a plus- positive blood smear, if you felt fine, if you didn't have symptoms, yeah, you know, I would want to know about the impact on symptomatic um, malaria. Um, the other, and, and I, I, Dixon started with this, is sort of the kinetics of those those antibodies. I mean, we yeah. really can basically design how long we want these antibodies to to last. You know, you That's right. basically are plasmids, and you pop in the targeting phase into whatever sort of FC. Um, you know, can even do this as a nanobody approach, um, and basically you can from a from a drug delivery point um, adjust the half life. Um, so you know, should this be repeated? every 90 days, right? Because the rainy season, what's the period of the rainy season? How much does timing matter here? Um, and the, the other, I guess I will mention is, so the initial um, 
um, editorial that circulated around. I, I actually have papers in front of me, like, you know, here from like trees that were chopped down. Um, and part, of, part of the editorial discussion was, you know, is this even viable? Like how much does it cost for that, for that 10 milligrams of, of antibodies? Um, and they were actually quoting a number, um, a production cost of about $50 per gram, right? So that would be five dollars per hundred. That would be fifty cents for ten milligrams. Um, you know, of course, you have to add in all the costs of infrastructure, of delivery, of refrigeration or freezing, uh, depending on how you prepare this. Injections, right? So this doesn't just, uh, you know, maybe use those micro patches or or other ways of delivering this. But um, I know I'll leave it. I'll sort of bring it back for any more discussion that people have. So I have a question, mm -hmm. which I think. <clears throat> Is the answer you guys should do, but it illustrates how this works. So they say the median parasitemia was the same in placebo and all the groups. So explain that and why it still works. <laughs> yeah. Um, so th that was actually, I think, one of my comments is this was a binary. They, they, there's sort of this idea, and maybe in Dixon and Christina, you can jump in us, that you know, there's a binary. You either get infected or you don't. Right. right. So the the, spor the sporozoites are gonna they're gonna make it to the hepatic stage or not. If they make it through, it's you know it's gonna be the same. So the suggestion here is Correct. you know is Dr. Griffin, you don't have to worry about severity because either you get infection or you don't, and you're not gonna impact severity with this. You're just gonna impact whether you get infection or not. So that's sort of the comment there. I, I would like to know about the symptoms as well, but I don't know, Dixon, Christina. Uh, well, I was thinking this was a highly malaria endemic area and these were adults, so they are likely to, you know, maybe have some clinical immunity um, against symptoms. Mm. So maybe that's why they did not consider that in this trial as much. But I don't know, just, just thinking um, that there may be many um, of these people, you know, even under non-trial conditions when they get malaria infections they may be actually subclinical so maybe that wasn't a consideration for that reason if i'm making any sense it no, is no, late it's actually it's a good point <laughs> no these eligible participants mm. had to be healthy adults 18 to 55 so they were yeah. they were leaving out the children they were leaving yep. out the more vulnerable seniors yeah and <clears throat> the other point that i would raise here is that they they followed this all the way out to 24 weeks and at what point did uh, each group become infected that was, um, quotes unquote, protected with the monoclonal? Uh, was there a longer delay uh, because the antibody decays over a certain length of time before, um, you know, if, if transmission was still going on at that time? Uh, this is a very difficult situation to assess all at once because there are multiple variables. Variables: What is the season? How many mosquitoes did they get exposed to each day? Where do they live? I know Molly has three different transmission zones, um, intermittent, um, seasonal, and continuous. And, and that's the reason why NIH had a big study going on there for a while. Um, <clears throat> was, was there any group that had sterile immunity. Yeah, so um, take us to figure two. So if you go to figure two in the paper, those of you that have access, and maybe <laughs> you want a journal, we'll open up the access doors for folks. Um, but it's really interesting. Um, figure two is great. So what they show is placebo is basically boom, 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 boom. You're marching up at a 45 degree angle and people mm -hmm. are just getting infected, getting infected all the way out. Um, if you look at the 10 and the 40 milligrams, you see very few infections, a couple right. percent in the first right. 90 days. And actually, the slope at 90 days starts to go up at, you know, about 40 degree, not quite 45. So these but, are naturally acquired infections. These are not laboratory-based yeah. infections like the other group was. Yeah, no, this right. is not a human right. challenge. This is people going out, living their life. And so, you know, so I saw figure two, and I was like, wow, you maybe right here at about day 90 is when it's time to get another dose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. You but know, I'd love to see can, the data for children. I mean, I think that's the group that you're really interested in, right? Yeah, I mean, and if you could do this at, you know, 50 cents a dose, that's, you know, a dollar a year to keep you from getting malaria. That, Come that's on. getting into, uh, yeah. I think that there are agencies out there that could afford to underwrite this, like the Gates Foundation and uh, 
Yeah. And WHO even. This this yeah. is a huge economic uh, driver. Yeah, and I, and I do worry about, you know, selecting resistance, right? I mean, of course, that's always... Um, but can you, can that would you jump be interesting. in? If you, can, if you can block transmission, right? Because that, that's ultimately what this can do. If people don't get infected... Right. You can't get gametocytes. You can't spread to the next person. That's right. So that's th- right. This is that's a right. transmission interruption intervention. Yes. The, the thing to make clear to the listeners, though, is that even if one parasite makes it to the liver, even though the antibody levels are huge, after that the game is over because the parasite wins because this sporozoite antigen is not on any of the other stages of the malaria parasite. And that's the tragedy of this. It has to be all or nothing. And um, I know that there's a vaccine also based on the gametocytes that prevents transmission from person to person because it interrupts the uh, life cycle in the stomach of the mosquito. But I I don't know how far that's gone over the last couple of years because I haven't followed the literature on it. But but this one, every time, if you (laughs) have a vaccine that's, I think a lot of vir- all the viral vaccines are that way, right, Vincent? You either get it or you don't. But does it dampen down? I mean, like, well, you don't after the initial high antibody levels. After you get immunized a few months, then you get infected. Always, none of them prevent infection. You just right, modify right. disease, right? Yes. What about a rabies vaccine, though? Does that prevent ever from getting infection? Well, no. usually, no, it doesn't. No. Okay. So. Yeah, I mean that's actually interesting. Yeah, this is this, this is, is not a vaccine. This, this, is, a, this is an intervention, and a, <coughs> yeah. you know, yeah, anti-parasitic yes. that prevents actual a, a, a prophylaxis. I can't um, believe that. I mean that that's the exciting part of this that I can't. If you could make this last for 120 days, let's say, at therapeutic levels, which would prevent sporozoite invasion of the liver, uh, you could probably use this to eradicate malaria. You need I've that link to join. I've got a couple of practical now. questions. Sorry, yeah, sorry, Dixon. I, I was, no, I was just okay. wondering. See, from a practical point of view, because this is either has to be administered by infusion, or at quite a large dose subcutaneously. So I don't know how practical that would really be in this setting. You know, if if that was something that is practic, can it be practically rolled out to the wider community? Yeah. Um, the only so people that's maybe something to think about. And then also the other thing is a thinking you probably would need to use that in combination with other interventions like the bed nets and, you know, treatment. Um, so that, that, I think, I mean, eradication would be wonderful, but I don't think on its own that would be quite sufficient. No, eradication of death. I don't mean eradication of the parasite. Yeah, okay. So right, this okay. would be useful between the ages of six months and five years of age. Mm. And after that, you're not going to die from it. You'll suffer from it, but you won't die from it uh, for the most part. So I think that's the age group that you're really aiming for. And, at, at, you know, I, you're right. I think that doing this it would be administratively difficult. You know, every newborn gets uh, an infusion of antibody. I think that's not going to happen. I mean, it is interesting, right? It's not the newborns that are dying. It's no, the, it's the, the six months to five older. years old. That's yeah, right. That's they're right. They're a little older. They're no longer breastfeeding. They've You're lost right. mom's protection. Um, so you can sort of target. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I like that you bring up, you know, practical issues, Christina, because, you know, there are sort of, so what, what amount of volume do you need for, for 10 milligrams? How much? It could be small. You could, you could put 10 milligrams. You could even put 40 milligrams in, in a fraction of an ml. Um, so we do we do these monoclonal shots, you know, 150 milligrams, you know, in in an mL or 1.5. So you're really about a tenth of a milliliter, 0.1 milliliter per 10. Um, so you know, 40, you know, so 0.4 mLs for your 40 milligrams. Um, there's no reason, right? And I think we've seen this with a lot of other products that you couldn't potentially have a um, um, Sub Q or intradermal, um, that it, it doesn't necessarily need to be um, intravenous because intravenous requires a, a technical expertise. Um, right. Really doesn't even seem mm-hmm. to be, you know, a reason we can't have other approaches. Um, and yeah, as, as mentioned, you, you know, technically um, the half life of, of antibodies can be modified, the route of administration right. um, can be um, modified. Uh, yeah. What about giving this? 
Uh, what about giving this to a uh, a nursing mother and having it come out in mother's milk? And how could you um, use this knowledge in order to allow her uh, newborn and her young child to continue to receive uh, what you would call maternal antibody, but in this case it's not. It's an antibody that you actually gave to the woman who just delivered so that when um, her levels of maternal antibodies drop below the trans transfer from mother's milk to young, you would substitute this monoclonal for that and it would continue onwards. How long do children nurse before they're weaned in Africa? So I mean, in, I think that's going to vary. Parts of, yeah, many, many parts of... Um, of sub-Saharan Africa, where this is a problem, um, three years. Three years. Um, yeah. So maybe even longer, some even a little bit longer. So, um, right. you know, this is one of those challenges where people come in with their formula companies and try to convince right. people. Exactly. That it's, uh, you know, exactly. Breastfeeding exactly. is a poor person practice. Right, so you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. But yeah, we've talked about this quite a bit where, you know, if this is a, um, if this is engineered to be an antibody that can cross, um, you know, and you give this to to pregnant individuals, right? That's a high risk period yeah. when you're pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if you yeah. get this while you're pregnant, you you could get protection during that period. So that would be a um, efficacious intervention. That'd be a Indeed. meaningful intervention. But then also, if this is given um, and has a has a half life such that there's a good level during, particularly during that third trimester, this is going to be passively um, delivered yes. to That's to right. the you know mm. to the unborn child. Who will then will be born with this protection. Um, and then, right, and then you have the potential to sort of step in after that. So. Right. Or then to have some oral, oral, oral approach to this so that, you know, it's protected going through the gut tract until it gets – how long after they're born are antibodies absorbed through the gut? And the answer, I guess, is about, what, three years, two years, something like that? Yeah, we don't – yeah. I mean that is interesting. I mean, you know, when a when a child is breastfeeding, they're they're absorbing antibodies. Yeah, they are. Yeah, the colostrum. Yeah, I used to call it colostrum, but uh, yeah, it's that first. Yeah, that first letdown. Of exactly. Them. Exactly. Right. Christina, I mean, you you had a question there. Um, do you know, it slipped my mind. I can't remember now. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry. So, Daniel, um, um, what can this go into people? Or does, do we have to do a phase three? What's the next step? Mm. Um. Yeah, I don't know at this point. This is, you know, th this is pretty impressive data. So, um, and then I guess a lot of the stuff we brought about, you know, is it is ready to go into a phase three trial? Um, based upon this data, I would say yes. I don't see mm -hmm. why, um, you know, you couldn't go ahead with a phase three trial. I mean, I'm I'm about to what? About a week. I'm I'm jumping on a plane. I, I would love to be taking, you know, get get my antibody um, yeah. infusion <laughs> rather than you know I have to right. remember to take my pills every morning. Yeah, but what about a um, an mRNA vaccine that takes advantage of this epitope that's recently been discovered that generated that monoclonal to begin with. Why not use the antigen just like we're using it for COVID and um, depend on your own immune system for taking over? That's a big yeah. if, right? We don't know. Yeah, it's it a big if. You, you know, you're going to prime or you're going to boost if you do Is that. Is anybody that paying work. attention to this out there? Are you listening? <laughs> Pfizer and Moderna? <laughs> yeah, and actually, if you're thinking about this, this is what, a dollar, you know, to protect exactly. someone for a year? Is, that seems to me like a cheaper price point than what are we going to start charging? 130 bucks per dose for those MRNA shots? You can't, do that. Shots? You can't so, do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. So I'm not sure. You know, this is interesting. If you really can produce these monoclonals cost effectively, um, you know, if I'm going on a trip and I get a shot, like before I get on the plane and I'm protected yeah. for my yeah. trip, that this exactly. could have travel health, um, you know, market opportunities. So. Yes. And dare I say military application as well. Military? Yeah. No, I mean, that's huge, right? We're about to like send folks in. You don't have to like start vaccinating. I'm sorry, we can't can't invade right. for, that's you right. know, <laughs> weeks. Gotta, it's a rainy season for our and, life, That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I actually right. read in the discussion that if I'm actually... Um, developed an antibody dice um, slightly different but it's about two to three times more potent in preclinical models and I think these so you can use a lot less so five milligrams per kilogram oh. so that would then obviously reduce the volume of your subcutaneous in fact um, inoculation as well and yeah. there's they mentioned two ongoing phase two trials that are involving children in Kenya and Mali and um 
Um, so these are ongoing. So we'll probably find out more about this. There's one soon. other one other approach that might. I'm sure that somebody has thought about this before. Um, I knew her, her father, and I'm blocking on her name. Her last name is Cerami. She uh, got her PhD at uh, NYU, and uh, she discovered the receptor in the um, um, sinusoids of the liver, which allows the sporozoite to attach in order to infect the parenchymal cells. Mm-hmm. So having... Um, an mRNA um, <laughs> programmed to produce quantities of this receptor, as long as it doesn't have any effect on the liver, of course, to combine with the sporozoites in the blood, they would never find the liver. They would never get there. They would never attach, and so therefore you could prevent them from invading. And uh, I'm not sure if anybody's ever looked into that as a, a viable approach, but it's, it certainly would be an interesting one. If you could couple that along with the antibody, then maybe you could get 100%. All right, we have to uh, move on because Daniel has another podcast coming up. <laughs> yes, the ID Puscast will be recording after this. So are we ready for a new case study? We are, we, we are, are, we are. We are, yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, I have to admit, I could probably talk about this for hours. I have to make it a career <laughs> discussing this. But, um, we have a new case, and this case will be oh. unveiled by a special guest. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about this when I was uh, with them at the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene annual meeting. And um, so this is a fresh case. Um, a man in his 20s, originally from Mali, <laughs> of all places. This is he Mali comes week. in with a dermatological complaint about one month after he returned from spending time in Bamako, Mali, with friends and family. Um, he reports this problem has been going on for months. He's getting very frustrated as he's not getting any answers. He relates that this started with itching over a blackhead resembling a pimple that was itchy and initially very small. Over the subsequent months, it started to get larger with ongoing itchiness but no pain, um, no erythema or warmth in the area. Um, other lesions started to develop in addition to this first one. There was no drainage from the skin lesions. He started putting triple antibiotic ointment on his lesions that he bought from a pharmacy. He then went to his primary care doctor who prescribed a topical medication and PO antibiotics, but this did not help. He reports that when in Mali, he stayed in his house with his parents, siblings, grandmother, and other extended relatives, more than 40 to 50 people under one roof. Um, Food made by his family, reports consumption of only cooked meat, no uncooked meat, ate salads, uncooked vegetables, no contact with any animals, no pets in the home, denies any contact with any pets or farm animals, so no pigs, no cows, no horses, no cattle. Um, This was a very thorough history, I'll say. Mm. Um, No swimming in any fresh water, (laughs) no lakes, no ponds, no hiking, no outdoor activity. Actually said I basically spent the time hanging out in the house, like visiting. No riding horses. Um, He was sexually active in Mali with women, um, and he was tested. He is uh, HIV negative. All right, so on exam, he has this 10 centimeter lesion over the anterior left thigh um, with a verrucous and vegetative appearance with yellow crusting over a central area. It's a heaped up lesion. It's not undermined. Uh, (laughs) There's no erythema, no warmth or drainage. Um, He has a similar smaller lesion measuring about three centimeters on the right flank. Um, He has a third smaller lesion with some mild crusting, um, about two centimeters over the right posterior thigh. Um, He ends up getting a biopsy, um, and I think we'll probably have to post this in the show notes, but I will say the histological features were not diagnostic. They did not find any evidence of any specific organisms. Um, The report was the exogenous material could represent some type of foreign body not identifiable as as part of a fly or arthropod, nor is it typical of a splinter, (laughs) and its presence in the specimen makes it problematic as to its significance. 
the microscopic description within the dermis, there is a dense, diffusely mixed cell inflammatory infiltrate, including many plasma cells and neutrophils. There is exogenous material. Uh, PAS, GMS, FITE, and gram stains are negative for infectious organisms. Additional testing is ordered that leads to the diagnosis. So um, ah. he, he is, he is as mentioned, he is planning on heading back to Mali sooner than later um, if he doesn't get a diagnosis because he thinks that the doctors in Mali <laughs> will know what this is. Wow. He's answered all my questions, Dan. Uh, <laughs> except the big one. What is it? <laughs> what is it? What's well, interesting, The Daniel. horse riding was very specific, wasn't it? That's quite unusually no specific. <laughs> <laughs> so do I don't know if people have any other questions that might help them with this. I will, I will mention um, it is itchy, but it is not painful. There's no pain. This is a pretty dramatic lesion mm. with no pain. Um, Mm. At every turn of your reading, it is I, a parasite. I'm going to give you that. Something. I thought about something. We are going to get a confirmation from the additional test that was ordered. Right. Uh, so, uh, Daniel, the um, the biopsy it says there is there are many plasma cells and neutrophils in the biopsy. So there is some foreign antigen in there, obviously, right? Something is in there that the immune system is not happy about. Yeah. Right. But the microscopic examination doesn't tell you what it is. No, no. But we might, you know, now it's 2022, so we have more tools. We uh, have you more do, tools you do. Than just microscopes. We <clears throat> so it suggests that whatever stuff. caused this isn't there anymore. I'm not going to say that, Dixon. Well, no, 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 no. That's my su- that is my suspicion. Yeah, it is that there. the horses have left the barn, yeah. and you're looking at an empty stable. So, Dixon... I- <laughs> not a case of it being too small because you would see something that's I know, parasitic, that's right. right. Well, unless it's some bacteria maybe, but no. Unless, but this is TWIP. I know, I know, this is TWIP. That's right. <laughs> not happening. No, no it's not. There are big lesions, like 10 centimeters. That's big. That's they're like, big. They're big. Exactly. They're it's big very lesions. large. Hmm. Hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> does, do any of his family also report... No, Similar no. lesions. No, yeah. it's just him. Just him. Um, okay. Yeah, just him. Just. Okay. Him. Intriguing. I'm gonna have next, to do some yeah, digging. Yeah. Next time we will get we'll get we'll find out what that initial that additional test was. We will. We'll find out you know how the diagnosis was addressed. Uh, That's right. How he's responding to treatment. Um, yeah. All right. And, and so, folks, yeah, so our questions will be, what could it be? Let's get a good differential here. And what would you do next? What would be right. your next test? And folks, let's let's get to this one. We're not recording for another month, so yeah, we're, we're recording. not recording until December 22nd. You okay, have December there 22nd. you have it, folks. December 22nd is That's your right. deadline. Get it in by then. That's right. You get a month. No excuses. <clears throat> we want to hear more from you than we did this time. And Santa will tell us the answer. <laughs> All right, that's TWIP211, show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIP. You can send your guesses to TWIP at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe. Exactly. Dixon, Dixon de Palmiers at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thanks, Dixon. Yeah, you're welcome, Vincent, and everybody else. Great seeing you all. Christina Naula is at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Christina. Well, thanks for having me. I had great fun as always. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. So who's going to do the thing now? Last time it was <laughs> we, we wrote last time it was me. Turns. And yeah. who wants to do it next, Dixon or Daniel? Who wants to do it? Dixon. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. That's fine. All right. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another week is parasitic. Oh, my God, Dixon. Another twip oh is parasitic. God. All right. 
let's try it again. <laughs> try it again, Dick. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Try one more time. One more time. You've You're been ready. listening to this week in parasitism. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. <laughs> <laughs>